morning. If you'd stay standing, that would be wonderful. If you'd like to, if you need to sit down, please have a seat. Hebrews chapter 2. If you have your Bibles or your iPhone, turn to that. We're going to read the first four chapters of that scripture. Um, you know, in my Bible, I've got a heading that was added by the editors, and it says, warning to pay attention. In some Bibles, like the New King, King James Version, they have a heading that says, do not neglect salvation. I think Terry's title of the sermon today would make a perfect heading for this. Drifting happens by neglect. So let's read God's word. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. What a beautiful day, and I'm glad that each one of you got here this morning. With the rain that we've been having, I told Gwen this morning, I feel like Paul Revere. That is, I wanted to ask you, one, if by land, or two, if by sea. That's how you arrived this morning. If you have your Bibles, keep it open there to Hebrews 2. We are going to look at some other passages as we go along. I heard about a young couple. They came to have an introductory meeting with the preacher uh, to do some premarital counseling. And this particular minister had a questionnaire that he had the couples fill out. The young man was particularly nervous. He didn't know the preacher, and this was the first time that he'd actually sat and talked with the preacher. So, you know, I know preachers can be a little intimidating, so he was a little bit nervous. On the form, the questionnaire, one of the questions was, are you entering into this marriage of your own free will? Well, the future bride was noticing that he was apprehensive, and he was sitting there, and she thought he was stuck on that question, so she reached over and she said, put down yes. It was his free will. Anyway, let me introduce to you an actor from the mid-19th century. His name was Edwin Thomas. He was a Shakespearean actor. He made his debut at the age of 15, performing in Richard III. He performed in New York, Hamlet, for 100 consecutive nights. When he toured in London, the critics there also were very approving of his Shakespearean abilities. When it came to tragedies, Edwin Thomas was in a select group. There were very few people who had the skill as an actor of Edwin Thomas. Edwin Thomas had two brothers. One was named John and one was named Junius. In 1863, the three of them performed Julius Caesar. And it just so happened that Edwin Thomas' brother, John, drew the role of Brutus. He played the assassin, which was somewhat of a portent of what would happen because it was two years later in Washington, D.C. at Ford's Theater that John snuck into the rear of the box where Abraham Lincoln sat and fired a pistol at his head, mortally wounding President Abraham Lincoln. Edwin, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, Edwin Thomas Booth, was so ashamed. It drove him into retirement, and he probably never would have returned to the stage if it had not been for a strange twist of events. At the New Jersey train station, there was Edwin Thomas Booth, and a well-dressed young man fell from the platform, fell between the platform and a moving train. Edwin quickly wrapped his leg around one of the rails, reached down and grabbed that young man, pulling him up to safety in the nick of time. The young man recognized Edwin Thomas Booth, but Edwin Thomas Booth did not recognize this well-dressed young man. Until a few weeks later, he received a letter, a letter that was written by General Adams Badeau, the chief secretary 
of the General Ulysses S. Grant. The letter thanked Edwin Thomas Booth for saving this young man who happened to be the son of an American hero. You see, that was the son of Abraham Lincoln, Robert Todd Lincoln. One brother had taken the president's life. The other brother had saved the president's son's life. It's not the first time that we see such a dichotomy. When we go back in the early pages of the Bible, there were brothers, Cain and Abel, same parents, same upbringing, but Cain chose death. Abel had chosen God. When we look in the Bible and we see Abraham and Lot, Abraham chose God and Lot chose Sodom. We see kings like Saul and David. Saul chose power, but David chose God. We look at two of the apostles, Peter and Judas. Both deny Jesus, but yet Peter chose mercy. Judas chose death. Free will. What I want you to think about this morning is we must remember we have a choice. When God created man, he created man in his image. And the first command that God gave that had any restriction there in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, the day that you eat, the day that you eat of this tree, you will surely die. There was a consequence. We understand consequences came with sin. That is a separation from God. You remember Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins it shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Sin, that is the choice to rebel against God in transgressing or going beyond the boundaries that God gave us, this is something that has a consequence and a separation from God. There is a spiritual death that occurs at once. And then there is a physical death which occurs eventually in everyone's life. What we understand is this choice, the power of choice, is that God loves you, but he doesn't force you to love him. God has demonstrated his love on every level. In the creation, God has demonstrated his love by giving us such a wonderful, powerful creation in which to live. God's love is demonstrated because he didn't leave us separated by sin, but he sent Jesus. The Bible tells us in a verse that everyone seems to know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Some translations play a little loose with that, and they say, shall not perish. It really means should not perish. There is an element of choice. It is something that you may choose. It is something that you may reject. When we think about God's word and what David read for us right here in Hebrews 2, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. You see, that free will that is there in choosing to obey the gospel, in choosing to hear the good news of salvation, is still in our lives even after we become Christians. God doesn't say, well, now you're one of mine, so I'm going to remove your ability to choose. I guarantee you every parent loves their child, and they try to shower them with that love, and they try to help them not only in providing and protecting them, but also teaching them that the choices that they make in life have their own consequences. I want you to look at a couple of verses to talk about this gospel that we have heard. You have your Bibles there first at uh, Hebrews. Just turn back a few pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look with me at verse 13. Paul's reminding this very young church, less than probably six months old, there at Thessalonica, how it is that they came to be Christians. And so Paul, in reminding them in chapter 2 and verse 13, 1 Thessalonians says, For this reason... We also thank God without ceasing, 
Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Look over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and likewise verse 13. Paul again reminds them, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Now look how this happened. Verse 14, To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, Paul's going to say, How do you not neglect? Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. We recognize we have a choice. The word of God has been heard. The disciples heard some strong words from Jesus when he talked about that he was the bread of life that came down from heaven and that they must eat of his flesh, they must drink of his blood. He was speaking spiritually or metaphorically. What they missed, though, was some of them drew away because of the hard saying which Jesus gave them. And Jesus looked at the twelve and he said, Will you also go away? Oh, in the classic way that Peter responds in John 6, 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have a choice. But those words are eternal life. Do you remember in Matthew 7, as Jesus came near the close of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about this choice. He talked to them about two gates, one that was narrow and one that was broad, two roads, again, one that was narrow and one that was wide. And then he talked to them about two destinations. Those two crowds were not just going to the same place. One was going to life and one was going to destruction. Would later tell a parable about sheep and goats in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and he says, Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And he said, One goes to eternal life and the other to everlasting destruction. In Matthew 25, 46, 2. Over and over in Jesus' parables, there are only two possible destinies. But understand, those two destinies are your choice. The greatest privilege in life that God has given to you and to me is to choose eternal life the sin that you and I have chosen doesn't get the final word death doesn't get the final say as long as we listen to the gospel if we've heard this message we must not neglect it we must give it heed but hearing and heeding are two different things there are a lot of things we hear there are a lot of good ideas I constantly hear good ideas. Gwen is so faithful to tell me about what I should stand back here. She tells me what I should be eating and what I should not be eating. All right? She does her part. There's no, there's no blame there. All right? But I don't always heed what she says. Thank you, Scott. Hearing what God says is not the same as heeding his message. We've got to turn our attention to what God tells us about our soul. And we've got to give our focus. We've got to say, God, you're right. And not only is this something which I should hear, it's not just something I should learn. It's something that I must obey. God is so faithful. And God's love to you is so faithful. He wants you to make that choice. And he didn't give you that choice for you to throw it away. He gave you that choice because he knows what love means. And love means he isn't going to force you. He's not going to coerce you. He's going to allow you to choose a covenant relationship that by being in Christ, Paul would say, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're told that every spiritual blessing is found in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.3. We're told what that looks like when John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. 
He tells us we keep on walking in the light because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our iniquities. Faithful and just is God. The covenant is available. The opportunity is made known by the gospel that God loves you. We must remember we have a choice. Secondly, we must be aware that we can drift. The mere fact that we've made a choice to become a child of God does not guarantee us that that choice is permanent. We get to choose whether we will. Look what he says, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, that is what God said, it happened. 100% what God told the people, whether there was some impending physical danger or condemnation, some judgment, it happened. When God warned them, when God warned the ancient world that there was an ark that was there for safety, how many chose to go inside the ark? Eight souls, according to 1 Peter 3. Eight souls went into the ark that was prepared for their salvation. The majority rejected, and they died. The word of God gives us this opportunity. It tells us what we can do, and it will prove steadfast. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the person, the man of God, should be equipped for every good work, thoroughly equipped, ready to do God's will for God's glory. We must be able to listen to what God has said and not neglect it. The idea of neglect is indifference or not paying sufficient attention to something that requires our attention. Several years ago, I had a lady come and visit with me on a Sunday evening in my office. She came to me and she was asking for my help. She was asking for the church's help. She needed some furniture moved. When I heard that, I thought, great. I actually like to move furniture. This is not a problem. This is easy. We'll round up a few people. We'll do this. But she went on. She told me that the furniture was inside of a house in which the roof had already caved in, in which the county had already condemned the property. She said, I can't ask people to go in to a place that's unsafe. As she described it to me, it sounded like that at any moment the rest of the house might just fall in. There was nothing left to do but for the house to be demolished and everything destroyed. How sad. If she had come to me six months earlier, she'd come to me a couple of years earlier, we could have done something, but there was nothing left to do in that moment. Why? Neglect. Neglect. I won't get into the reasons why she had let things go, but what I'm going to tell you is that our soul demands that we don't let everything just cave in, that we don't let the world around us get into our soul and corrupt it, that we don't let the world cause us to drift. We must exercise that caution. We must exercise what we need. Question. Is my respect for God growing or diminishing? Am I getting closer to God? Is my understanding of God's will clearer today than it was five years ago? Am I growing in my understanding so that as I talk with people, my friends, my neighbors, the people I care about, am I able to express what God has done through the gospel, the offer of salvation, and the transformation in my life? Are the things that I'm doing done in the name of Jesus Christ? Jesus said, whoever gives a cup of cold water in my name shall not lose his reward. You see, if I'm living in the name of Jesus, I'm living under the umbrella of his authority. I'm doing those things. Paul would say in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, the authority of Jesus Christ means I'm listening to the New Testament. I'm doing the things that I know God wants me to do in teaching the gospel, the plan of salvation. I'm telling people they must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. 
Mark 16, 16. I'm telling them that they must repent and be baptized in order to have the remission of their sins, Acts 2, 38. I'm telling people that when they become a Christian, they must be faithful until death to receive the crown of life, Revelation 2, 10. I'm telling people that worship is what God prescribes, not what people like, not just what people want to do for their own entertainment, for their own personal pleasure. I'm telling people, church should wear no other name but the name of Christ. We should be Christians only. We should put Christ on everything that we do. It is the church that belongs to Christ. It's not just a, a, a group or an assembly out of the community. It is a church that wears the name of Christ. He purchased it with his blood. When we have that kind of authority, we recognize that the local church is organized by Christ. We speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. We're not trying to make up rules and bind them on people, nor are we trying to let go of the things that God has said. We're doing things Biblically. The possibility of this drifting. The Hebrew, talk, the Hebrew writer talks about. What David mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 2 is the first of five warnings. There's the second one. This first one is about neglect. The second one is in chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. It's talking about the hardness of heart through unbelief. In chapter 5, 11 through 6, 11, he's talking about the dullness to the Word of God, not letting the Word help us to grow. You can't stay the same. You can't remain immature and give God the glory. Chapter 10, he's talking about the, the one in chapter, chapter 10, verses 26 to 39 of drawing back. In other words, because there's opposition of saying, I didn't sign up for this. No, we stand firm. We stand unashamed. Of the gospel and then in chapter 12 the fifth warning in verses 25 to 29 is about refusing to let God speak you see these five warnings are progressive okay these five warnings drift further and further away when you finally say I'm not even gonna listen to God anymore that's where it leads what you've got to do is not neglect so what we understand is that this choice that we make is making sure that we stand firm. Paul said, I bring my body into subjection lest after I have preached to others, I should myself become disqualified. See, it's possible to drift so far. We must choose not to drift by not neglecting God's word. What the Hebrew writer says, if we neglect so great a salvation, if we neglect so great a salvation, this message was spoken by Jesus, this message was confirmed by the Holy Spirit, through the signs and the wonders and the miracles that were performed, God put his stamp of approval, his confirmation, his seal. This is it. Listen. Just like the Father said over Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Who are we listening to? Are we drifting because we're listening to other voices? Are we hearing the sirens of those who are promoting something that is not biblical? Are we satisfied with what God said? You remember in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables. There's the parable of a lost sheep. That sheep was lost innocently because, and I don't mean to offend anybody, it was a dumb animal, okay? That's what sheep do, they wander. The second parable was a lost coin. This coin was lost irresponsibly. The woman realized she had it, she let it slip away, she swept the house until she found it. The third parable was not of a sheep or a coin. It was a lost son, and that son was lost intentionally. The son chose to wander away. The son chose to drift away from the security of his father and his home and everything provided there. The son intentionally walked away. When you think about the father, the shepherd went and looked for the sheep. The woman swept the house. What did the father do? Oh, it wasn't a lack of love, but he waited. You see, that free will of that son, the father waited. The father watched until the son 
hit rock bottom, was stirred by the memory of his home and wanted to return, and he came back, and as soon as the son was approaching, the father ran to meet him. He kissed him, threw his arms around him. He killed the fatted calf. He rejoiced over the return of his son. My son, who was dead, is now alive. Neglect. Drifting. We can come home. There are plenty of things in this life you and I don't have any choice over. You didn't have any choice over the race you were born, the place you were born, the parents you were given. You didn't have any choice whether you were born into poverty. And we have a whole lot of folks that were born somewhere around that period of the 30s that was called the Great Depression. So there are many people in this very assembly this morning who have overcome places of limitation of resources in their early life. But understand, all of those things, you didn't choose your gender. And that's right, there's only two, male and female. I don't care what anybody else says, you have, two set, you have a set of chromosomes, you're either XX or XY, and that's it. Biologically, there is no other choice. But how many things you didn't choose? But there are things you do choose. If I got to choose, you know what I would have chosen? I'd have chosen to be six foot two so I could play professional sports somewhere, somehow. I would have chosen a high IQ. That ship sailed. I would have chosen good health. I am appreciative for that. But understand, the one thing that God has said that you and I get to choose is our eternal destiny. You and I get to choose whether we'll listen to what God says. In the book right after Hebrews, in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If you hear the word of God, you have a choice. Are you going to listen to God, or are you going to listen to man? Are you going to listen to God, or are you going to listen to yourself? Are you going to listen to God and receive what he promises you, or are you going to neglect it because something else caused you to drift? You have the ability to hear it. You should know. I told you earlier about the story of two brothers. One chose life. One chose death. They had the same parents. They had the same profession. They had the same passion. But how differently their lives were. There was a wise man who was once known that he always had the right answer. There was a young man who was desperately out to prove the wise man wrong. And so he came to the wise man one day and he held in his hand a small bird. And he asked the wise man, is the bird alive or dead? The young man had it in his mind that whatever the older man said, he would be able to prove him wrong. If he said the bird was alive, he would squeeze quickly, the bird would be dead. If the man said the bird was dead, he would open his hands and the bird would fly away. Either way, he thought he had the old man right where he wanted him. The old man never looked at the young man's hands, but he looked into the young man's eyes and he said, said, it is as you choose it to be. It is as you choose it to be. Your life, it is as you choose it to be. You can choose life. Obey the gospel this morning. Be baptized into Christ. You can be restored. If there's something in your life that you know is not right, make it right. Make a choice. But don't let it drift. If you neglect the opportunity today, I will guarantee you that Satan will harden your heart and it will be even more impervious the next time. Make your choice. It is as you choose it to be. If you need to come, come now while we stand and while we sing.